Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on the Israeli economy, a story of success and costs. This event is brought to you by the YNS Nazarian Center for Israel Studies at UCLA and is co-sponsored by the UCLA Anne and Walter von Grimm Seminar in Economic and Entrepreneurial History. I'm Dov Waxman, the director of the Nazarian Center and the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair of Israel Studies at UCLA. I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Joseph Zaira. He is a professor of economics at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and he's also been a professor, a visiting professor at Harvard, Columbia, Brown, Brandeis, and Northwestern University, to name just a few. Dr. Zaira is a macroeconomist who specializes in a number of areas, technology and economic growth, income distribution, money and liquidity, and the economy of Israel. In addition to his academic research, Dr. Zaira also participates in the X Group, where Israelis, Palestinians, and others study the economic aspects of a potential peace between Israel and Palestine. He's also been an advisor to the Minister of Finance in Israel, a member of an Israeli government committee for reducing poverty in Israel, and from 2016 to 2020, he was the president of the Israeli Economic Association. In 2018, he published the book, The Israeli Economy in Hebrew, and an English version of the book was published last year by Princeton University Press. His talk today is based upon this book, which I highly recommend. During Dr. Zira's presentation, you're welcome to send us your questions using the Q&A function, and I will put those questions to him at the end. Dr. Zira has also very kindly offered to meet directly with audience members after his presentation so that you can ask him questions directly. So the Zoom address for this meeting, which will take place immediately after this webinar ends, will be provided to you in the chat box. I encourage you to join him for that one-on-one, uh, -on -one, uh, for that discussion and conversation, which will be taking place after this event ends. So without any further ado, let me welcome Professor Joseph Zira. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present uh, some results from my book. And I will immediately uh, share with you the screen of my presentation. Okay, I hope everyone sees it well. And uh, this is how the book looks. It's in Princeton University Press book. And uh, I will start briefly with some historical background. The one very important element, which we cannot understand the, uh, the whole history of Israel without it, is of course the Jewish immigration to Palestine and then to Israel. It started with a large immigration from the East European countries from 1882, but the large majority of these immigrants went to the United States. And only small numbers arrived in, in, in Palestine at the time. The big change came in 1924. From 1924, this immigration became mass immigration and larger numbers started to come to, to Palestine. As you can see, what, what turned the tide from the US to Palestine? Actually, it was a development in the United States. Because in 1924, there was the Johnson-Reed Act, which put a cap on, on a, a quota on immigration due to ethnic minority. And, and the, the, the Jews who could enter the United States were of small number. So a lot of them decided instead to immigrate to Palestine. Although Palestine was much more riskier and much poorer, but it was still better than the probably the high risk and high poverty that they experienced in East Europe. And you can see then the second wave of immigration was at the rise of Nazism at the early 30s. And then of course, after the Second World War where, where both Holocaust survivors started to come to, Palestine, to Israel and also the first waves of immigration from the Arab countries of people who couldn't stay in the Arab countries when they were having a war with the Jewish state. So they, they had to, they found themselves in a position that they had to immigrate and they immigrated to Israel in large numbers. The second graph shows another element that is uh, 
is ex Israel experiences from early days, which is the conflict, the Israeli-Arab conflict. And that was also interesting because it, it's not a conflict that is ongoing every day. It's a conflict that is dormant for many years and then there is an eruption. So once, once in a time there is an eruption, some of the eruptions were very big. This, this is according to military fatalities, but I'll show you later the economic costs and they look uh, similar, but not exactly similar. So we will talk about this later, but definitely the conflict with its various eruptions and changing character is, is some background, historical background that is impossible to understand the Israel economy without it. Okay, this is the map of Israel and I presume that people who, who know Israel well or, or are interested in Israel a little bit know the map. Just to show you that you can see some of the elements, major elements of the conflict even today. And there are, uh, you can see the area of Israel which is around 78% of historical Palestine and the West Bank and Gaza that are something around 22% of historical Palestine. And they are basically the area which is contested between the two peoples nowadays. Okay, in my talk, I will go over a number of uh, topics. One is I'll talk a little bit about what made the Israeli economy growth. And then I'll talk about some of the growth that we haven't done yet. And I'll talk about what's called in Israel, the low labor productivity. I will talk a little bit about the high-tech sector in Israel that some, some Americans call it Israel because of it, startup nation. And I will then turn to the cost of the conflict. Then I will talk to some about something which is semi-economic and semi-political, which is the tragedy of the labor movement. And finally, I will talk about how Israel can constitute it's an interesting experiment in neoliberal policies. Okay, without further ado, let me move to economic growth. So the following table shows the economic growth uh, uh, since the beginning of the British mandate in 1922. And I ask you to look at the bottom, bottom row, which is GDP per capita. So you can see that for almost 50 years from 1922, basically until 1972, the beginning of the 70s, the rate of growth of GDP per capita was very high. Israel had a rate of 5% annually. And after that, the rate of growth declined. It declined, but it's not, it's not much lower than other countries, other Western developed countries. So in a sense, you can say that there was a phenomenon here, a phenomenon of catching up with the advanced countries. Israel be began as a very poor country. It caught up in the first 50 years until 1970 or more precisely 72. We'll see it in a moment. And then it remained at growing at the same uh, rate uh, until today. Uh, this graph described GDP per capita in Israel in real terms, 2015 prices. And notice that the graph is uh, semi-logarithmic. So actually, the slope of the curves of the curve gives you the rate of growth of output per capita. So you can see here clearly that until 1972, Israel was growing at a very high rate of around 5%. And from 1972 on, it was growing at a lower rate, but not so low. It's something like 1.7% annually which is very close to the rate of growth of the US. So we can say that the first period until 1972 was the catching up, and then there was a period of a lower rate of growth, more like the countries that we are in the neighborhood of. So Israel now is, uh, since 72, is around number 30 approximately in the world in terms of level of income per capita. Now, what do, what do I show in the book? I'm showing, uh, um, this graph shows that you can explain all the economic growth in Israel by looking at, at its total factor productivity. So economists can calculate the total factor productivity 
and from the total factor productivity, we can calculate the equilibrium uh, level of output. So the red curve is the equilibrium level of output, while the blue curve is the, the actual output. And one thing we see interesting is that basically the red curve and the blue curve follow each other quite well. So actually the, the rise in productivity can give us almost a full explanation of the economic growth in Israel. Another interesting thing is the assumption that I made when I calculated the equilibrium output per capita per hour. I assumed that I'm, I'm looking at, 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 uh, at an open economy with full capital mobility. Now, of course, people remember that in Israel for many years, it was very hard to purchase dollars, but that is not the right measure for capital mobility. The question for capital mobility is not whether we can export uh, currency, but whether there is an import of currency in order to finance investment. And that came quite, quite freely as I'll show later. So the assumption that Israel was an open economy is also corroborated by this graph. But then the question remains, what increased productivity? And I will show that there are basically two candidates that economists always think about them, which increased productivity over the years. The first is education. So here you can see the GDP per worker, the labor productivity is the blue curve, and the green curve is the GDP per worker as it is explained by education. We know that uh, every year of education increases wages and human capital by around 10%. Actually, in my book, I measure it much more accurately in Israel, and I get a much more realistic picture that in the first years, it in, in productivity increases by more than 10% and later by 8%. But I'm using these figures that are that, that I measured in Israel in order, and also the distribution of education in the population. And, and the graph shows that basically the expansion of education can explain almost, almost half of the economic growth from 1973 on. I, I, connected the two graphs of GDP per worker and the part explained by education at the year 1973 for some obvious reasons that will become clear in a moment. So from 73 on, the GDP per worker, uh, uh, the education, expansion of education can explain almost 50% of the growth. It explains much less in the early years of the state because the rate of growth was much faster. And the expansion of education, although it was a little bit faster than later, but still it was much slower. So in, in that period from the year 1955 to 1973, the rise of education, the expansion of education can explain at most 15% of economic. It's not nothing, but it's not as, as much as later on. And then I did second thinking. And, and thought about what happened in the first 20 years of the state. Now, as you remember, there was a huge wave of immigration in the beginning of the state when Israel opened its gates in, in May, 1948. And a lot of the people who both Holocaust survivors from Europe and also people from Arab countries could go in. And that created, a, 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 and the population of Israel doubled from 1948 to 1951, within three years, it doubled. It was a large wave of immigration, which we saw in the graph before. Now, we know, and that is a result found in many, many uh, immigrant countries, by, first by the Simon Kuznets and then by other economies, that when immigrants arrive to a new country, they lose almost 50 or even more than that, between 50 and 70% of the human capital upon arrival. They don't speak the language, they don't know the country, they don't know the labor market, they have to settle in. All these things cause them to lose much of the human capital. 
But then in the next 20 years, they regain back the human capital because they learn all these things in the language and the country, and the technology and everything else. And at the end, they go back to normal. So all these immigrants that arrived in 1950, until 1951, increase in the next 20 years until from 1951 until 1971 or 72, they increase the human capital by 100% because at the beginning it went down by, by half and then they regain it to back to normal. So it's an increase of 20% of 20 over 20, of, uh, 100% over 20 years, which means an annual rise in human capital of something like 3.5%. So remembering that more than half of the population was composed of new immigrants, that gives you a rate of growth of 1.75% every year. So that's why the, the green curve is much, is much steeper in this in, during these years from 1955 to 1972. And, and here also the rise in human capital explains close to 40% of the rate of growth. So 40% so of growth will, could be explained by human capital. The rest of it can be explained by technology. And, and that is another element that increases productivity according to all to all uh, uh, economies who study economic growth. Now, Israel in this sense was unique because it didn't have to wait for new technologies to be invented because it started as, as a backward economy. So it could take a lot of technologies that were invented before off the shelf and adopt them. And it could adopt them quite fast. So I'm giving here a few examples from a data set by Diego Comin. And uh, I'm comparing uh, the technologies between Israel and the US. And again, it's in, per, it's in number of uh, machines per, per thousand in the population. And you can see that while in the US already the number of tractors was declining, in Israel it was increasing quite fast from around three and a half to almost seven, it doubled within 20, within 20 years. A similar things is with respect to shipping. You can see that the increase in shipping in Israel in tons per thousand during the first 20 years from 1950 to 1970 was extremely fast. The, the US dynamics are quite interesting. You can see a sudden rise during the Second World War, but later it declined again. And now the amount of shipping in the US is lower than in Israel, which is of course not surprising because Israel is a much more open economy and it needs international trade much more than the US due to its small size. Uh, flights, the same story. In both countries, the number of flights increased due to the population becoming richer and flights becoming much more available. But of course, the, the, the speed of adoption of flights in Israel during the 50s and the 60s was much faster. You can see that during that period, it increased from around 40 to something around 700 or 800. So it increased by a factor of 20, while in the US, it increased by much less by something like from 100 to 800 by eight. Okay, uh, the, the, other, the other technology is telephones, telephones per thousand. Again, uh, Israel began with much less telephones, less than 20 per thousand, and it grew up much faster than the US. Of course, remember that the graph here is also semi-logarithmic, so the slope of the curve is the rate of growth of adoption, and it was much faster than this. So clearly both education and adoption of technologies can explain much of the economic growth in Israel. The question is of course, 
how come other countries don't do the same? Why don't they adopt technologies off the shelf if it's so simple to do? And the answer is, of course, that it's not simple at all because you need to invest. You need to buy tractors, you need to buy airplanes, you need to buy ships, you need to buy telephones and uh, centers for telecommunication and stuff like that. So the question is how you finance your investment. Now, the, the first equation is a simple identity, what we call national accounting identity. And it says that investment can be basically financed in two potential ways. One is by saving, which is Y minus C minus G is output minus con private consumption minus government consumption, which is saving. And the second is through a trade deficit, which is imports minus exports. So you can either finance your investment from within or through a trade deficit. And interestingly, throughout almost all its history, Israel financed its investment in economic growth by a trade deficit. The question is, of course, how you finance it. Because creating a trade deficit, you need to have funds from abroad in order to pay for it. Or you need to take to create to take large loans in the global capital markets. And that's not easy for a poor country. That's why most poor countries, most developing countries can do it nowadays. But Israel could do it, why? During the British mandate, it, the, the trade deficit, which was around 115 million pounds, was financed almost completely by simply by the money that the immigrants brought with them. So the immigrants who came mostly from Poland and then from Germany brought with them enough funds in order to pay or to finance almost all the investment. In addition to that, they also, there were also Jewish donations and Zionist donations of around 65 million pounds. So altogether, it covered all the trade deficit plus. Now for a few years after 48, Israel faced a severe problem because there were no rich immigrants anymore. The immigrants were either Holocaust survivors who were penniless, or people who had to leave the Arab countries and leave all their wealth behind them. So in those few years, between 58 to 52, Israel had to finance its investment by imposing saving on the population, by forced saving through the famous Tsena program, which people had to, to purchase things, consume, consumption goods with, uh, with uh, stamps. And, and there were large limitations on consumption. But that couldn't hold for a long time because there was a development of the black market and so on. So at some point, the leadership of Israel, mainly Ben Gurion, realized that they have to find another solution. And then they, they finished the negotiations with the Germans and signed the reparation agreement. And the reparation agreement was not an easy thing because it was something like seven years after the end of the Holocaust and Israel signed an agreement that basically meant giving almost all the, almost like forgiving in a sense. And, and there was a lot of political opposition to it, but Ben-Gurion prevailed and actually saved economic growth in Israel. In the years 1949 to 1965, the trade deficit was 6 billion. And 2 billion were by Jewish donations and other 2 billion by German reparation money. And then borrowing only 2 billion out of the six was relatively easy. So in a sense, the secret of economic growth was the fact that this was a migration of people from the Middle East. They had money, they had education, and even when they didn't have money, the money that belonged to their relatives who died in the Holocaust replaced their money. So in a sense, this is, in my view, this is the secret behind the fast economic growth of Israel in, this, in the 50 years from 1922 to 1972.
Okay, I want to talk now about the status of output today in Israel about low productivity. So until 72, Israel caught up with the rich countries, but apparently it didn't fully catch up with, with the most advanced ones. So if you look at the second row in this table, table, you can see the relative output per hour in Israel in 2017 relative to the leading Western countries. So we are 56% of the US, 68% relative to UK, 60% relative to Germany. And in general, we are something like 63% relative to the G7. How can we explain it? First of all, I, in order to explain it, I, I do the comparison, I make the comparison between Israel and the US. And uh, I'm comparing only the business sectors. I don't want to go into details, but the calculation of GDP has a lot of, of uh, uh, inaccuracies in it. And, all, and the only reliable, accurate uh, comparison can, can be made between business sectors. Now, if you look at the US and Israel, you can see that Israel was growing much faster until 1972, 73. And then it stabilized at a rate of growth, which was pretty much similar to the US. But in 1993, we suddenly see a decline, a decline that is approximately 7% of the GDP of, of the productivity in the US. By the way, the numbers here are in dollars because these are output per hour in 2015 prices, both in the US and in Israel. So what caused the decline in productivity after 93? The answer is straightforward. This was the immigration from the ex-Soviet Union. Because as I told you before about the Kuznets effect, when the immigrants arrived to a new country, they don't know the language, they don't know the job market and so on, they lose at least 50, between 50 to 70% on average of the human capital. Now it's true that the immigrants were relatively highly educated people and people with, a, with great capabilities. But if you take out 50 to 70% of their ability, they contributed much less than the average in Israel. and Therefore they caused this decline in productivity. There's nothing to do about it. I mean, this is a price that any immigrant, every immigrant pays upon arrival to a new country. And you immigrate mostly for your children and not so much for yourself. But this explains at least one part of the reduction in, of the lower productivity. Labor productivity, by the way, is exactly output per hour in this case. Okay, let us turn to another explanation. And for that explanation, I'm comparing the capital levels. So you remember in economics, people believe that production is done mainly by two factors of production, which is labor and capital. Now the stock of capital in Israel is significantly lower than the stock of capital in the US. And the way we measure it is by comparing not just capital levels themselves, but cap the ratio between capital to output. So as you can see, the ratio, the capital output ratio in Israel is around one, one while in the US it's around 1.6. Now it fluctuates a little bit, but you can look at the average and see by yourself. Now that in itself can explain a huge difference, which is something like 21% relative to the US. So that means that together with the other explanation, I have an explanation to 21 plus 7.5 which is around 28.5, which is around two thirds of the gap between Israel and the US, which is quite significant. Now the question is why capital in Israel is so low? So according to the standard economic theory, the, the capital output ratio is equal to, to this, to this uh, co quotient, which is alpha, and I'll say immediately something about it, divided by the cost, uh, the marginal cost of capital, which is the sum of the interest rate, R, the, the real interest rate, D, which is the depreciation rate of capital, and P, which is the risk premium that investors bear. Now the alpha is what we call usually the share of capital in output, which is a 
around one third in most countries over time. It's, it's one of the stable figures in economics. So alpha is quite similar in both countries. The interest rate is quite similar between Israel and the US. We face the same global capital markets and it's the same interest rate. The rate of depreciation is also quite similar. It's something between eight and 10%. So therefore the main difference is the risk premium. So it shows that Israel is much, much riskier. Now the, the only plausible explanation why Israel is persistently much more risky than the US is of course the Israeli Arab. And let me give you some indications for that. First of all, you can see that before 67, 1967, the level of capital output in Israel was something around 1.2. And then it declined to around 1. Because we know that in 1967, there was a severe intensification of the conflict. The US had a much lower uh, capital output ratio in the 60s. And only during the 70s, it increased to its current level of 1.6. Not surprisingly, these were the years where the Vietnam War ended. So it seems that conflicts have an effect on the capital output ratio. Okay, I wanna move to the next uh, issue, which is the high-tech sector. And this is the relative size of the high-tech sector, which increased mainly during the 90s and reached a level of 10% of the labor force, and it remains at this level until today. Now, if you remember, I, I mentioned a little bit the book, uh, uh, Startup Nation by Senor and some other author, and Zinger, Zinger and Senor, who claim have may, maybe two claims. First of all, that the productivity of high-tech in Israel is exceptional. And the second thing that this is a miracle that explains the economic growth. So I wanted to check these two claims. First of all, the exceptionality of productivity. Well, I don't have productivity on all the high-tech sectors in the world, but I have about ICT, which is kind of almost 70% of the Israeli high-tech sector. So in the OECD in general, average productivity of high-tech, of of uh, ICT relative to general uh, average productivity is 1.8. In the US, it's 1.94, and in Israel, it is 1.3. So not so exceptional after all. The second issue is that the high-tech sector explains the rapid economic growth in Israel. Well, first of all, we see that the economic growth in Israel from the 80s to the present didn't, didn't didn't change much after 1990 when, or, or even 2000 when, when the high-tech sector reached it, uh, its current size. It remains approximately at the same rate. The slope of the curve is just the same. But we can ask the following question. Maybe, maybe, maybe the rate of growth didn't increase, but maybe if we didn't develop a, a large high-tech sector, it would have declined. And, and that's, that is a possibility. And I tried to examine it by comparing Israel to two countries that have very small high tech sectors. Well, in Israel, it's 10% of the labor force. In Italy, it's around 3.5%. And in France, it's around 4%. So clearly, these are two countries with much smaller high tech sectors. Now, if we compare ourselves to Italy, Italy stopped growing at the year 2000. And Maybe it was also the result of the lack of high tech sector. Maybe in that sense, uh, it helped Israel. But if we compare Israel to France, France grew even faster with a small high tech sector. It, it was hit much more by the, by, the, by the financial crisis in the, in the late 2000s. And after that, its rate of growth declined. But until 2006, 2007, it was growing even a little bit faster than Israel. So it's hard to tell. And I'm, I'm leaving it as an open question. Let me now say a few words about the cost of the conflict. 
and I will start with the uh, with the direct cost, namely the the defense budgets, the defense cost as part of the government uh, expenditures. And you can see that there was a huge rise after sixty seven. That's what I said: the intensification of the conflict. And then after the year nineteen eighty, we see a sharp decline from uh, more than twenty percent of GDP. Uh, by the way, all this graph measures it in percentages of GDP. So at the top period of uh, after the Yom Kippur War, we reached a level of more than 30% of GDP. But after 1980, there is a significant decline to a current level of around 6% of GDP, which is of course still much higher than most countries in the OECD, but it's much lower than it used to be. And there is no doubt that the decline was a result of the peace with Egypt. Because the peace with Egypt, with Egypt enabled Israel in a sense to end the period of the conflict, Israel and the Arab states. Because the Arab states cannot form a fighting coalition against Israel without Egypt. It's, it's the biggest and strongest army in the area uh, among the Arab countries. So in a sense, the, the peace with Egypt made us return to the original conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. And that is a much less costly conflict. It doesn't cost much. It's a conflict which is not conventional wars with airplanes and with tanks and, and much artillery. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a militia warfare to a large extent. But there are additional costs to the conflict, which we usually don't measure. And here I'm gonna talk about one, one of these costs. Look at the blue curve, which is the curve of, of average uh, wages of men in Israel, Jewish men in Israel, who usually go to serve in the army. And it starts to rise only at the age of 22. Now, why it rises over time? Mostly because they accumulate education, but they also accumulate experience and on the job training and so on. So it rises both with years of schooling and with age. Now, what would happen if there was no conscription? Then the curve would start to rise already at the age of 18. Like in the United States, kids go to college already at the age of 18, and then they start to accumulate human capital. So now I can calculate for each cohort the exact loss of human capital, which is the vertical difference between the red curve and the blue curve. And together I can sum it up and I can show, as this table shows, that the loss of human capital due to conscription is something like 5.7% of GDP, which is quite a lot. And I calculated some more additional costs and altogether they almost double the amount, this calculation was done for the data of 2011. And it almost doubles the, the, the cost from around 7% of GDP to something like 14% of GDP. If you add to that the 26% of loss of, of output due to high risk, then you can get a cost which is close to 40% of GDP, which is enormous. Okay, let me now talk a little bit about the labor movement. And uh, I, I'm going to talk about the labor movement when they became the state. So after 48, the labor movement became not only the leader of the, of the uh, Zionist movement, but also the government. And they could enforce any policy they could choose. And a lot of people claim that they, they pursued a very socialist policy. Now, the following table shows the public and private ownership of, of output of the net domestic product during the 50s. Now, on the face of it, it shows indeed that the public sector was increasing and the private sector was decreasing. But it's surprising that the rise of the public sector was very mild and the same with the decline of the private sector. 
And the reason for that is that the nationalizations were very minimal. And most of them were not because of any socialist desire, but mostly because of national needs for development. And this is the electric company, the Dead Sea uh, factories, and the oil company, Delic. So the, the need for development required some electric services and the electric company couldn't do it. Who could do it? The government. Why? Because it channeled all the money that came from the German reparations. So it could use this money in order to boost these companies and their effectivity. And another thing the government did was to buy shares of companies in order to support them without getting the authority of the parliament. And, and it even didn't put delegates on the boards, which shows that they didn't do it out of socialistic ideology, but mostly because they wanted to help companies that, that had difficulties. Actually, an interesting story is when the, the cement company Nesha wanted to sell the company to the Istadrut, to the labor union. David Horowitz, which was uh, at the time the chair, uh, the general director of the Ministry of Finance, strongly opposed it and prevented it in order not to deter foreign investment. So in a sense, the stories about the socialist characteristics of the country in the early years are quite exaggerated. Not only that, we can see that after 62, we even had a short period of liberalization. There is a decline in, in the public sector in those few years until 1967. And there is a rise in the, in the private sector in, in those years. Of course, this process stopped after the Six Day War, after 67, because now, again, there was an increase in government intervention in order to build the military industries and so on. So you have this, so instead of having a dynamics from socialism to, to, to liberalism much later on, you have like a, a much more intricate dynamics and you can see it. And only after the peace with Egypt, by the way, that happened in around 1980, you can suddenly see a significant decline in the public sector and a significantly rise in the private sector. So in a sense, what my claim here is that it's not that the government, that Mapai government was very socialistic. It intervened in the, in the, in the economy when there was national needs to absorb the immigration in the 50s, to cope with a rising conflict in the six, late 60s and 70s. But whenever it could, it liberalized the economy. It liberalized the economy in 62, and it was part of liberalizations after 1980 as well. By the way, you can see this, this dynamics, type of dynamics also if you look in other types of interventions. For example, the taxes on imports, the share of taxes in imports was rising in the 50s, declining very significantly in the 60s, rising again after 67 and then declining until now. The same thing you can see with the subsidies to ex exports in percent of GDP. A rise in the 50s, more intervention, liberalization in the early 60s, and that is Mapai government. Rising after 67 because of the pressure of the conflict, and then after the peace with Egypt, after the security problems were resolved to a large extent, a significant decline to close to zero. So these policies, the roots of these policies by the labor movement, I think are in the deep past of the, of the movement. And from the beginning, the labor movement adjusted to a situation that was very different from Europe. In Europe, you had to take care of the workers in their workforces. But the workers who came to, to Palestine had a very different problem. They had to find jobs to begin with. So that led to three interesting department departures from social democracy. One was a support to private investment. 
the labor movement really supported private investors and tried to give them the best conditions possible because they create the jobs. Furthermore, the labor movement became an employer in itself. And the third thing was ethnic discrimination, what sometimes was called avodaivrit, or basically it was a, a opposition to giving jobs to Arabs. So, but but so this this suited the interest of the of the immigrants workers until the 1960s. But once, but in the 1960s, already most of the immigrants were settled in jobs and the rate of unemployment was very small. And suddenly the workers needed a different service. They needed someone to represent them in, in their workforce, in their workplaces. And the labor movement couldn't do it. And that created a, a significant rift that only went worse and worse later. And in a sense, this you feel it even today. So the remnants of the labor movement are completely alienated to the working classes and the lower classes. Okay, I, I, I have two or three more minutes, Dov. Yes, yes. Okay, I wanna talk about an experiment in neoliberal policies. As you can see, this is the fiscal policy in Israel from 1960 on. The black curve is public expenditures. The blue curve is income, public income. And the red curve is the deficit, which is the difference. This is really a fantastic roller coaster. You have a huge rise during the after 67 because of the conflict. And it was not only the direct military costs, but also some additional costs, which I'll mention in a moment. And then after the peace with Egypt, there was a significant decline of public expenditures and a significant decline also of public income. Now, this is a classic experiment in, in neo, neoliberal uh, policy. You reduce the size of government from almost 80% to close to 40%. So you reduce it by half. And you reduce also taxes by half. So the question is, how did this affect? Uh, first of all, how, how did expenditures decline? The decline was of three elements, which were all dependent on the, uh, on the conflict. The first was, of course, direct defense expenditures. And you can see how they re were reduced significantly from 1980 on. The second was interest payments. Because if you remember, during the time of the high, high defense costs and high public expenditures, there was a huge public deficit and it accumulated a large debt and therefore the interest payments were high. They were almost up to 13% of GDP. Now, once the deficit was closed in 1985 to a large extent due to the peace with Egypt, you could reduce the interest payment significantly. The third element is support to the business sector. Now, during the high years of the conflict, not only defense costs were high, but also a lot of people went to reserve service. People went to reserve service not a month and sometimes not even two or three months, but even more than that, a year, each year. Now, companies suffered significantly and came to the government and asked for help. The government needed to subsidize them more and more. So the subsidies rose significantly, but after the peace up with Egypt, they could decline quite fast. So all these three uh, significant expenditures were, were down. Now, what did the government do with it? It could do two things. One was to take the resources and increase some other, exp the residual expenditures like education, health, welfare, and so on. The other thing was not to increase these expenditures, but simply to reduce taxes. What did the government choose? To reduce taxes. As you can see in the top, top row, the residual expenditures didn't increase at all. They, they moved from around 28% to around 30%. Now, even the 2% were not any, a true increase because in 1995, there was an added health tax that didn't exist before. People paid a tax, but they paid it directly to their HMOs. 
And in 1995, the system of HMOs was nationalized and people paid this tax through the government. So that is the 2% that, that were added. Nothing else. Generally, other expenditures remain in terms of percentages of GDP the same. And what went down were the taxes, mostly the direct taxes, income tax and other similar taxes, corporate taxes and so on. Now, what was the effect on economic growth? Nothing. You can see that from 1972 till 2013, the rate of growth remained as it was. It output didn't grow by much. Where was the effect? The effect was on, on inequality in the re a reduction in redistribution. Now, in order to see it, I'm looking here at the Gini coefficients of income, which measure inequality. Now I'm talking about two types of income. Uh, usually economists talk about two types of income when they measure inequality. One is market income, which is the income you, you earn from the labor market. And the other is disposable income after you pay taxes and get subsidies. So the red curve, the difference in Gini, really represents the degree of redistribution the direct taxes and subsidies, welfare subsidies, are creating. And you can see that this redistribution is going down, is declining. And the next graph shows that if you do an international comparison between the size of the public expenditures and the redistribution measured by the difference in the Gini, then they are strongly correlated. So in other words, the more the government is involved in the economy, the more it redistributes between the, between the rich and the poor. And the fact that Israel reduced uh, its public expenditure so significantly means, and especially its taxes, means that its redistribution has declined over the years. So the result of the new liberal experiment was not a boost to output, but an increase in, in, in inequality due to increased redistribution. Okay, so uh, uh, to sum it up, uh, economic growth was mainly due to the fact that the immigrants were from middle class. The costs of the conflict are much higher than the direct defense costs. The chasm between the labor movement and the lower classes is inherent and wouldn't disappear, at least in the foreseeable future. And neoliberalism is, didn't affect output, but raised inequality. These are the main lessons from what, we, from what I focused on. There are many other issues in the book, of course, and I don't have the time to go into. Thank you very much. Questions, please. Thank you, Dr. Zira. That was a fascinating economic history. Um, I, we have just a few minutes for questions, so I want to encourage everybody um, who has questions to uh, join uh, Dr. Zira in the um, Zoom room that we have set up. You should see the link in the uh, chat box where you can ask him your questions directly. Um, I'm just going to pose a couple of questions that have come in so far. Um, one question from uh, Martin Kleppner um, asks about specifically the economic impact um, of uh, Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel, Arab citizens of Israel and ultra-Orthodox Jews, two populations uh, that are rapidly growing, that uh, account for a larger share of new entrants into the labor market, uh, populations that are uh, typically uh, less highly educated and, and have less access to technology education in particular. So, um, if you could say something about those two populations in particular and the, the kind of economic impact and challenges of, with those groups. Well, first of all, it's true that uh, the Arab population has less years of schooling than the Jewish population, but this has been changing since we start to have data. So if, if at uh, the year 1961, the high education of Jews was around uh, seven times larger than among the Arabs, this ratio declined now to something like two. So I, I'm not saying that the gaps disappeared, but they are, they are growing. I mean, the, 
we cannot ignore the fact that public education in Israel has done a tremendous job in, in, in both increasing economic growth, as I described before, more than 40% of economic growth is driven by education expansion, and also reducing gaps significantly. It's not over yet. There are gaps not only between Jews and Arabs, but also between, between uh, Sephardic Jews and Sephardic Jews. Even the second generation, kids who were born in Israel, and are, there are still gaps of something uh, of quite, quite significant. But again, this is also falling over the years. Now, above the Haredim is a bit more difficult because the Haredim have many years of schooling. The average years of schooling of Haredim is 18. But the problem is that the years of schooling in Yeshiva don't give them uh, much benefit in the, in the labor market. Their, their level of uh, human capital is equivalent to a secular kid who studied something like six years of school only. So that, that is a significant problem and, and there are ways to overcome it, but I, but I believe that it, it should be overcome mainly by, by doing things in consensus and not in forcing uh, sort of education on them. But let me say something about inequality. A lot of the people claim that, well, inequality in Israel is mainly because of the of the Haredim and the Arabs. They are the poorer populations and it's mostly them. Netanyahu once said that without the Haredim and, and Arabs, we're quite well. And that's not true. Because if you look at the, at, at the measure of inequality of, of market income, which really reflects the, the level of income people earn in the job market, then Israel is not much more unequal than other OECD countries. It's around the average. But if you look at disposable income after the intervention and the redistribution of the government, then we are much more unequal than the Arabs. So the inequality we have is not because of the Arabs and the Haredi. It's because of the government. It's because of its economic policy. And it's very convenient, obviously, to blame it on the uh, Arabs and the Haredi oh, rather than... Always, always. <laughs> Especially that now most of them are not even in the government. They become a complete scapegoat. Right. Um, so a final question from me before I encourage everybody to join you in the salon afterwards. How different is what you've presented, this, this very rigorous understanding of Israel's actual economic history, to the public narrative about Israel's economic history? It seems to me that what you've presented is, uh, you know, very factually based empirical understanding of the actual history. The, the, the narrative, if you like, the public understanding seems quite different. Is that correct? I, 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 think, I think I differ from the narratives, the common narratives in a few, in a few issues, but, uh, but I'm not the only one. For example, the narrative that Israel used to be a socialist country under Mapai and now it become under Likud, it become a capitalist country which I think is wrong. Israel was always a capitalist country and, and, and Mapai did it knowingly because they cared much more about the national project than about anything else. And in a sense, they even had a good point because that was the interest of the working people at the time to find jobs. But, uh, but I'm not the only one who says it. I think that the late uh, Zev Sternhal said similar things. Yes. And, uh, and I even cite in my book, uh, another book by, by Asaf Razin and Ephraim Satka who say similar things. So, so it, it depends, you know. I, I, I think that some of the questions, for example, what causes low labor productivity in Israel are still open. And I, th I know that many economists and including also the OECD claim that it's mostly about because of the bureaucracy in Israel and because of the, uh, of uh, high, uh, but but I show that uh, it, it's mostly because of the high risk of the Israeli Arab conflict. And this is not uh, something I think that's generally well understood in Israel. I mean, people don't really talk about the cost of the conflict. Yeah, people don't like to talk about the economic cost of the conflict. But 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 there was someone who wrote about it before me. In 1985, Eitan Berglas, who was a very 
kind of mainstream economists wrote a, an article on that. And mu much of my work in that area came from my, my experiment to try and update his work because a lot of the stuff he wrote about changed uh, institutionally, but also at, his, at the time there were not enough economics to calculate. For example, the cost of human capital, the whole concept of how to calculate it developed only in the late 90s. And he died before that. And he wrote this article in 1985. So there were, there, I needed to update things. And some of the other things I, I ran into accidentally, like the cost, like people know that the low productivity is, is also because of low levels of capital in Israel. That I understood also from the Bank of Israel, but they didn't put the finger on the right reason. for it. I, I must add something about the cost of the conflict, which is important, especially because I know that there are some Palestinian listeners here and some other people from Arab countries. I focus in my book mostly about the cost of Israel, the, the cost of the conflict to Israel. The cost of the conflict to the Arab countries and, and nowadays mainly to the Palestinians are enormous. In relative numbers, they are much bigger. We, I did some calculation of that in one of the papers I wrote for the X group and it should be available in one of our volumes. It was published in 2015. And, and these are huge costs. But in the book, I focus only on the cost to Israel, to Israel itself. Okay, well, thank you so much. I want to um, thank you for that really uh, informative, enlightening, interesting presentation. Uh, I want to encourage everybody who has questions uh, that they would like to pose directly to Professor Zera, who's kindly agreed to uh, stay. Uh, please join us in the um, salon that we will be holding immediately after this. So we will uh, end this and encourage you all to join him there. You can talk to him directly and ask him uh, more questions. Um, so please do that. Um, and for everyone else, I want to uh, uh, thank you for joining us and encourage you to join us again for our next webinar, which will be taking place next week on Wednesday, February the 23rd. The topic will be the challenges facing Israel's Supreme Court. I will be talking with former president of the Supreme Court of Israel, Dorit Benish, and legal scholars, Dr. Yuval Shemi and Dr. Manal Totri Juban. It should be a very interesting event. It's co-organized with the Israel Democracy Institute. So I hope to see many of you next Wednesday at our webinar. And again, please uh, join Dr. Zira in the salon discussion immediately following this. And thank you again, Dr. Zira, for your informative presentation.